Good evening and welcome. I'm Beth Hunt in the KATV studios tonight. Thanks for watching along with us. This is the second in a series of webcasts focused on your health that KATV is producing in partnership with CHI St. Vincent. I'm joined tonight by Dr. Morris Kelly, interventional cardiologist with CHI St. Vincent Heart Institute at the North Little Rock Clinic. And over the next half hour, we'll be focusing on heart attack awareness. And we'd like to answer any questions that you may have about heart disease and heart attacks. We invite you to submit them in the comments section of this web stream. We'll answer your questions as we get them. In the meantime, Dr. Kelly, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Yeah, my first question, what's the difference in a cardiologist and an interventional cardiologist, which is what you are? Right, so a, a general cardiologist can help to diagnose problems, um, find out that you have blockage in your heart arteries, uh, notice if your blood pressure is running high, if you have high cholesterol. Um, an interventional cardiologist is basically a general cardiologist that can also uh, provide provide an intervention or step in and, and provide a service that will allow us to fix a blockage uh, in your heart arteries uh, by either doing angioplasty or stenting. Yeah, we know that this is an, an important topic because heart disease continues to be the leading cause of death among Arkansans. How does Central Arkansas compare to other regions? I would say Central Arkansas has a higher rate of uh, heart disease, uh, including uh, strokes and any kind of other kind of vascular disease uh, than most areas in the country, uh, especially in Arkansas. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, unfortunately, we're always in the top in terms of poorest diet and uh, obesity, levels of obesity and uh, lack of exercise. And so those things contribute to our um, higher rates of having heart disease. What are some of the causes for heart attacks? I'm sure it's different for everyone. Yeah, so uh, we worry about um, people having heart attacks when they, they um, uh, exert themselves or are under ex uh, extra stress. Mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things can lead to a heart attack. Uh, we really believe that a lot of it has to do with inflammation in the heart arteries, and so you have a blockage that gets inflamed, and then either some sort of stress, physical stress or emotional stress, can lead to that, um, that uh, artery becoming inflamed and, and, and developing a heart attack. There are a lot of different ideas about what a heart attack looks like. Um, what should people be looking out for? What should they pay attention to? Right, so any symptoms that get worse when you exert yourself, uh, whether it be chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, lightheadedness, dizziness, uh, palpitations, nausea, anything like that, uh, either when you're climbing a flight of stairs or you're carrying something heavy across the parking lot, uh, any symptom that gets worse when you exert yourself, that's something that you should be concerned about being a, a potential sign of a heart attack. Yeah. Are the, the symptoms different in, in men and women? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we generally think that men will have a, the classic uh, heavy chest pain that goes into their neck and down their arm. Uh, women will have more of the associated symptoms of nausea, sweatiness, or lightheadedness, that sort of thing. So again, any symptom that gets worse when you exert yourself, whether you're a man or a woman, you should consider that uh, a flag for possible heart disease. Right. Is there such a thing as a minor heart attack? I mean, people who may not feel that it's that serious? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that there's a such thing as a minor heart attack, especially since you don't know how uh, major or minor it's going to be when you're having the symptoms. We can tell uh, how much damage you've had to your heart later on. We can say that it was a small area that was involved, but when you start having those symptoms and when you come into the hospital, we have no way of knowing how bad the, the blockage is going to be or how severe it's going to be. So you can't just say that it, it's going to be a minor heart attack. You should always treat every heart attack as if it's a major one. Is it possible that someone could have a heart attack and not even know it, not, not have many of these symptoms? Yeah, um, because the, the symptoms aren't classic necessarily, especially in women. Uh, and men may tend to downplay some of their symptoms. They may say, hey, I had a little bit of nausea and it wasn't that big of a deal, or I climbed a flight of stairs and got a little short of breath. Um, and you can have some damage to your heart, uh, whether it's ma minor or major, uh, with those symptoms and just not know that it was a heart attack that you were having. And we can do some tests later on to determine, yes, in fact, you had a heart attack. And when you describe your symptoms and say, hey, that happened six months ago, we can say, okay, well, that's probably when it happened. Right. What is the difference between a heart attack and cardiac arrest? Well, a heart attack is any blockage to the heart arteries or blood supply to the heart. Uh, if that blockage or, or uh, blockage is enough that it causes the heart to stop, uh, beating or it causes an arrhythmia that uh, doesn't allow the heart to beat like it's supposed to, then we call that cardiac arrest. Is there a group of people that are at a higher risk of a heart attack than anyone else? Yeah, I would say that um, diabetics particularly are at higher risk of having uh, heart disease. Basically, if you have um, diabetes, if you the person who has uh, 
diabetes but has never had a heart attack before has the same risk of having a heart attack as someone who's already had a heart attack mm -hmm. before. And so um, we call that a, a, an angel, a, a cardiac equivalent when you have diabetes. All right, well, one procedure that can help doctors uh, diagnose and treat cardiac patients is called cardiac catheterization, a procedure that is generally considered very safe. With more tonight, here's Channel 7's Erin Holly. This is a cardiac catheterization. It's a procedure to determine how well the heart is working. Uh, the doctor either gets access either in the arm artery, which is the radial artery, or the leg artery, which is the femoral artery. Um, and puts in a plastic tube, which is what we use to work through um, to be able to do the procedure. Dr. Morris Kelly, an interventional cardiologist with CHI St. Vincent Heart Institute in North Little Rock, explains a catheter is sent up to the heart and dye is used to see any blockages. Generally, the procedure is done when patients show symptoms of a blockage. Um, they may or may not have already had a stress test or some other procedure that demonstrates that they are getting decreased blood flow to their heart or their lab work suggests that there's a blockage or something like that. He says there are three scenarios. Either we get in there, we don't find anything, so it sounds like your chest pain that did sound like it was coming from your heart isn't coming from your heart. You may have some minor blockage that we can treat with medicine. The second scenario is you have a blockage that we can fix with either angioplasty or stents, and we generally uh, do that while you're in the cardiac catheterization lab at that time. Or you have too much blockage for us to fix with stents, and then we're talking bypass surgery. And again, Dr. Morris Kelly, the cardiologist with CHI St. Vincent Heart Institute in North Little Rock. And that procedure, is it, uh, is it fairly common for people to come in and have this done? And how quickly can they get in and out? Yeah, it's a fairly routine procedure that we mm -hmm. perform on a daily basis. Um, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to take the pictures to kind of determine if you have a blockage that's severe enough that needs uh, intervention or not. Mm -hmm. um, if we do an intervention, it can take up to an hour, an hour and a half sometimes to fix it. Okay. We have some Facebook questions coming in, so let's go ahead and get to those. First up, we have Mike Meadows, and he wants to know, is a pulse rate of 120 suspect for a heart attack? Yeah, um, we consider a normal heart rate between 60 and 80 beats per minute. We call it fast if it's over 100 beats per minute. So 120 beats per minute is definitely in the fast range. Um, does it suggest a heart attack specifically? Not necessarily. We can, you can have some sort of other arrhythmia that may um, lead to your heart running fast. Um, so I, I would say that if you're, ha if you're having a heart rate of 120 beats per minute and you're having palpitations, symptoms with it, especially dizziness or lightheadedness, it's definitely something to get evaluated. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. Eric Hayes, he says, I had a bad heart attack this year and sometimes I have a sharp pain in my chest. I have two stents put in. Why does it hurt sometimes and sometimes I still can't sleep? Yeah, um, right after we put stents in, sometimes you can have a little bit of residual chest pain just mm -hmm. because we're kind of modifying that artery and creating and, and getting it back to the size that it's supposed to be. Um, sometimes you can have blockages that weren't that didn't need to be fixed at the time that we placed the stents and therefore we need to keep an eye on those. And so if you're having residual chest pain after you've had stents put in, uh, we need to check it out to make sure that it's not an issue with the stent that was put in mm -hmm. or another blockage somewhere else. About how long should that pain last? Uh, usually just a few days. So yes. if you're having more pain further out than that, then it's something to get evaluated. Okay, thanks for your question. Up next, uh, Nan Burns. How can we tell the difference between a heart attack versus a panic or stress attack? Okay, and we, we kind of talked about the symptoms of a heart attack at the mm -hmm. beginning. So anything that gets worse when you exert yourself, um, that is more likely to be related to your heart. Um, if you can identify the stressor uh, in particular that's causing sort of your symptoms, um, then you can usually uh, attribute that to panic or stress. Okay. Um, here is one uh, from April, and I, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce <laughs> her last name. Uh, but she says, my husband is a diabetic with high sugar and an LDL of 1600. Is this a concern? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, LDL of, 100, of 1600 is mm -hmm. very high. Uh, we worry about it being uh, elevated when it's above 160 or so. So or even a total cholesterol of over 200 yeah. uh, is worrisome. So definitely um, that needs to be evaluated and treated if possible. Okay, there you go. Um, it also says, um, this is from Diane Collier. She says, are medically induced stress tests as accurate as physical? 
Yes, we get a little bit more information from a physical stress test. That's where we, uh, the patient is placed on a treadmill and exercised to a, a certain heart rate, and, and we're able to monitor their heart rate and heart rhythm. Um, it gives us an, an idea of their exercise tolerance, so we can see how fit you are when you do the treadmill. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of how much information we get uh, from the imaging part of that stress test, where we're able to actually look at the blood flow to your heart, it's about the same. Okay. Here's another one from Daryl Parker tonight. What are the signs of a blockage? Every now and then I get a sharp pain above my heart, um, yet my left arm tingles. Should I get checked out? Yeah, any chest pain that uh, is related to a, an associated symptom where it's radiating or moving down into your arm, I would say is something to be concerned about. Uh, not everyone has the heavy pressure-like pain that we uh, described before. Uh, sometimes it can be sharp, sometimes it can be dull, sometimes it can just be kind of a nagging, achy pain. Uh, any chest pain that is radiating like that uh, should be evaluated, especially to make sure it's not your heart, but it, it could also be other things. How important is it just in general for people to know their bodies, first of all, and, and really take action if they feel like something is wrong? Yeah, um, I get a lot of patients that say, well, this is just naturally part of aging, and this is just me getting older. And um, there are certain things that you can say are attributable to just getting older, but um, if you're able to usually walk, say, three blocks without having any symptoms, and all of a sudden you're down to two blocks or one block, any limitation of, some, any limitation of your usual activity, uh, you should be worried about uh, your heart. Okay, quick shout out to you. Whitney Reed says, love Dr. Kelly, so thankful for the care he provides to my patients. I'm sure that makes you feel good. Yeah, it does, absolutely, yeah. thank you. All right, here's another one, Maylisha Reed. I've been having chest pains and pains in my shoulder and hands. Should this be a big concern if blood pressure stays high? Yeah, especially if your blood pressure runs high, um, and we call, you know, depending on your age, but anything above, we call normal blood pressure 120 over 80, so mm -hmm. above that we start to get concerned about it. Um, but any kind of symptom that you have, especially when your blood pressure runs high, uh, we worry about sort of a hypertensive emergency or urgency. Uh, symptoms associated with high blood pressure, headache, blurry vision, arm pain, numbness, any kind of weakness, focal weakness especially, um, those are concerning. Okay, um, as we wait for more comments to come up, uh, real quickly, what are some of the resources for people here in Central Arkansas, and specifically at CHI St. Vincent um, North, I guess with regard to cath lab and other things that you have access to? Yeah, we really have a state-of-the-art uh, cath lab at uh, St. Vincent North. We're able to perform uh, numerous procedures um, that they can perform anywhere in the state or anywhere in the country, actually. Um, we're able to perform numerous procedures in terms of angioplasty and stenting. We can provide um, EP studies, which are electrophysiology studies where we can diagnose arrhythmias and treat those arrhythmias at the same time, uh, providing uh, hemodynamic support in case of patients that need to have high risk procedures. Uh, so the, the cath lab at, uh, at St. Vincent North is really top of the line. And let's also talk a little bit about technology and best practices and have they changed the ways that we determine whether someone is having a heart attack or even how you respond? Yeah, we're always uh, trying to revamp and, and, and improve how we treat heart attacks. And one thing that we've incorporated is being able to get an EKG uh, in the field so the patient is out uh, in a remote area. Um, the EMS um, staff is able to transmit an EKG that lets us know, hey, this patient's having a heart attack and that will allow us to expedite them getting uh, the care that they need. Okay, what range of cardiology resources will someone encounter when they come to CHI St. Vincent North? Well, uh, it pretty much is one-stop shopping. I mean, you come to St. Vincent's, uh, CHI St. Vincent, and we are able to provide uh, specialists that uh, provide interventional care, EP specialists, cardi uh, congestive heart failure specialists, um, pretty much any um, procedure that you need done, uh, we can provide it at St. Vincent. Okay, and um, just overall, what are some ways that, that patients can take control of their heart health and reduce their risk of having a heart attack? There are so many things just day to day that they can do to reduce their risk, right? Right, so um, if you have high blood pressure, make sure that you're getting it checked and that you're taking your medications, make sure that your uh, blood pressure is getting under control. Um, continue to uh, take your hypercholesterol uh, medications to lower your cholesterol. Um, try to get in some regular exercise three to five times a week. Um, try to get your uh, body weight down to as, much, as close to ideal as possible. Um, and then again, if you're having any kind of symptoms that you're concerned about, talk to your regular doctor who uh, may be able to set you up with a cardiologist. Um, and um, also be aware of your family history. If you have a family mm -hmm. history of early heart disease, um, also be concerned about getting uh, checked out even earlier. 
Okay, here's another question tonight from Katie Coke. What symptoms require an ER visit? I recently did a 24 hour holster and there were some episodes of beats that were pausing for 4.6 seconds and I'm still having random chest pains quite a bit. My appointment is a little far out and she's wondering if she should go to the ER instead. Yeah, how do you determine how big of an emergency it is. Yeah, it sounds like if she's already having a procedure done or at least some monitoring done, then uh, she's at least um, gotten involved with a cardiologist or, or being seen by a cardiologist. Um, when we place uh, Holter monitors on patients, we're able to see how uh, their heart rhythm is working, if they're having any uh, pauses or, or gaps in their beats. Um, and we're able to get that information back to us and, uh, pretty quickly uh, within 24 hours, uh, 48 hours. Um, so um, that information should be passed on to her cardiologist already, uh, but if she's continuing to have symptoms even while she's being monitored and, and it's before sh her scheduled visit, then absolutely go to the emergency room yeah. and get it checked out. Okay, listen to your body for sure. Joshua Cook uh, wants to know at what age should he start thinking about his heart health if he hasn't had any notable problems or should it even be a concern? Yeah, I would say, um, again, if you have an early family history, then you mm -hmm. want to kind of take uh, that as a marker. If your father had a heart attack at age 40, then, you know, you should really start thinking about uh, getting evaluated at age 30 or so. Um, but at, for most people, the general population, I would say men should start worrying about it at age 40 and women at age 50 or so. Okay, Eric Hayes wants to know if there is a good smartwatch to help him keep an eye on his heart. We did a story earlier this week um, about one of the smartwatches and how it was able to detect AFib. Mm -hmm. How do you feel, how accurate do you feel these smartwatches are? Yeah, I think the, uh, the smartwatches are actually a good screening tool. Mm -hmm. um, we've been able to use those in our clinic in terms of uh, patients that can say, hey, look, I've, I have a smartwatch, my rhythm shows that it's irregular, or my heart rate is always above 100. Um, uh, smartwatches and those type of devices kind of help us out in terms of uh, giving us some information that we wouldn't normally get uh, without providing a procedure or doing a, a test uh, beyond that. Okay. Um, Teresa Tyler says, under your sternum, um, I have what it feels like twisting with heartburn and then the area is tender. Should she be concerned about that? Yeah, uh, we worry about heartburn, especially if your symptoms are uh, related to you eating. And mm -hmm. so if you're having symptoms that only come on when you eat or eat certain foods, then it's usually heartburn. Again, if it's not worse when you exert yourself, it's usually not your heart necessarily. Um, and then also if it's uh, tender to touch, that usually uh, reflects a musculoskeletal problem where you either have a muscle, a pulled muscle or inflammation in your muscle or bone. Uh, if it's tender, you can, usually can't um, bring on heart pain by pushing on it. So if it's, if it's tender to touch, then it's usually not your heart. Okay, here we go. Here is one from Diane Hobbs. She says, hi doctor, can a hiatal hernia, a hiatal hernia lead to heart problems? Yeah. Uh, not what is that, first of all? So a high hernia, hernia, usually uh, what happens is your esophagus, your food pipe, goes down your chest and it goes through your diaphragm to get into your abdomen and your stomach is below that. Um, so a high hiatal hernia happens when your stomach pushes up through the diaphragm. And so now you have a portion of your stomach that's now in your chest cavity and therefore um, the muscle that usually keeps food from going from your stomach back into your esophagus is exposed and it allows uh, gas or um, acid to get back from your stomach into your esophagus. Mm. Um, it can mimic symptoms of a heart attack because your esophagus does go right behind your heart and your right. chest and so if you're having acid into your esophagus it feels like it's right there in the middle of your chest and you worry about it being a heart attack. Um, if you take some antacids and it gets better or if you stop eating certain foods and it goes away then it's usually not your heart. Right, okay. Uh, Kate wants to know, and we addressed this earlier, but for those just now joining us it may be good to revisit it. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the warning signs of heart issues for women since they may not be the same symptoms for men? Yeah, so again we talked about how women may have more of the associated symptoms than the necessary chest pain that men would have. Uh, so any sort of nausea, sweatiness, lightheadedness, dizziness, palpitations, stuff like that. Um, that comes on when you exert yourself, like I said, climbing stairs or carrying something heavy or walking a long distance, any symptom like that that gets worse with exertion, then I would worry about it. Okay, James Humble tonight wants to know if, if you have a greater risk of having a heart attack down the road if you've had open heart surgery before. Yeah, um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not like a one-to-one -one relationship necessarily, but obviously if you've already developed a blockage to the point that you need to have open heart surgery, then you, um, there are, there's a lot of uh, lifestyle changes and modifications that you need to make to try to prevent yourself from having 
further blockage or having a heart attack. And so it's very important that you um, do the things that we talked about in terms of blood pressure and exercise and um, getting your cholesterol checked. Yeah. Uh, Becky Wagner with another shout out tonight. She said, that's my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of your patients um, on here tonight, we mentioned before um, some of the risk factors when it comes to having a heart attack. Let's talk about those again. So the risk factors for having a heart attack, um, well, the risk factors of a developing heart disease mm -hmm. in general, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, uh, smoking, um, lack of exercise, and then a poor diet, all of those things can contribute to you um, developing blockage in your heart arteries. And then if you develop blockage in your heart arteries in the first place, then that, that puts you at risk of having a heart attack. Right. Um, just living a healthy lifestyle, I would imagine, would really cut down on the number of patients that you see oh, absolutely. who have heart problems. Talk about the importance of diet and exercise. Yeah, diet, um, trying to get in a balanced diet that um, is not high in fat and cholesterol, um, high in salt. Uh, so you want to stick to a low sodium, low cholesterol diet. I generally recommend like the Mediterranean diet. Mm -hmm. um, it has a lot of grilled chicken, grilled fish, uh, a lot of the green vegetables, a lot of good oils. Um, that's a, a, a good diet to kind of stick to and, and look up and, and follow. Um, getting in some exercise, even if you're um, just walking uh, 30 minutes a day, five days a week, uh, something like that. Start there, um, increase your pace, increase your distance, uh, decrease the amount of time that it takes you to walk that same distance and that and you can kind of push yourself. Um, and along with that, um, maintaining a good um, body weight, trying to get down back to your ideal weight as close as possible. Okay, here's a question from uh, Doug Westgate. He says, long QT interval, scary or not so much? Um, it can be. Uh, that is, that's a, a rhythm problem where um, the amount of time that it takes for your heart to sort of reset after a beat um, is longer than it should be. Um, and so we do work, and, and the problem with that is if a beat comes uh, quick after that, then it can cause an arrhythmia. Uh, so yes, uh, it's definitely something that needs to be monitored. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to do EKGs when, when you come into the office, so we can kind of keep an eye on how long your QT was before and kind of compare it to in the future. Um, and then we have special doctors that can uh, evaluate that and treat that if need be. Okay, thanks for the question. And Shirley Davis tonight, she says, my valve in the back of my heart is leaking. I don't know how bad, but they said I might have to come to Little Rock to St. Vincent. Um, she says she feels weak uh, to go through it. She has congestive heart failure on top of uh, the other therapy in three times a week trying to get her heart stronger. So it sounds like she has a lot of issues going on. Yeah, and um, we worry about uh, leaky valves when they get to be severe. Um, there's, there's three grades that can be moderate, mild, moderate, or severe. Uh, we don't usually do anything about them until they're severe, but th we do kind of watch them and monitor them when they're mild and moderate. Um, having a leaky valve just by itself isn't a, isn't a major issue. It doesn't usually cause symptoms necessarily, but if we uh, identify that you have a leaky valve and you start having symptoms of shortness of breath or dizziness or swelling in your legs, that's when we would uh, kind of keep a closer eye on it and make sure it's not getting to the point that we need to do something yeah. about it. Catherine Marie encouraging all diabetics to check their heart after her husband, she says, had triple bypass. Really important for them to, to stay monitored. Yeah, especially diabetics um, wanting to keep their, their blood sugars under control mm -hmm. uh, can, can keep them from uh, developing heart disease. Um, they're already at higher risk, and so anything that they can do to, uh, to modify that risk is good. Is there a certain age where people just, even if for peace of mind, they need to maybe have a full workup and just really get checked out to make sure everything is working properly? Yeah, uh, especially if you have a family history, mm -hmm. I would say to get that done as early as possible. Um, in general, we try to use sort of symptom-driven uh, uh, tools. In other words, patients come in with specific symptoms and say, this is what's going on, and we say, okay, this is the test you need for that, or this is the test you need uh, to evaluate that. Um, I don't generally do just... Um, overall testing uh, or uh, kind of blanket testing uh, but if a patient comes in with a specific symptom then we'll try to tailor their care and uh, do tests that are specific to their problem. Mm -hmm. What is the number one concern among people who come to see you would you say? I'd say you know we see a lot of chest pain we mm -hmm. see a lot of palpitations uh, patients that are having difficulty getting their blood pressure under control uh, we also treat peripheral artery disease so blockage in the leg arteries which can also lead to claudication or uh, pain in your legs when you walk, um, different arrhythmias. So um, we are a full service clinic. We treat general cardiology, interventional cardiology, EP, um, everything. Okay, we have some more questions coming in here. And 
actually I think you already answered these, but maybe a good good time to revisit them. Um, talking about the the age and heart health and how big of a, a factor that is, someone's age and you know whether they could have a heart attack or not. Yeah, um, you know, it, it comes back down to family history. I mean, if you have uh, grandparents who live to be 80s and 90s, and uh, it's it's your genes are pretty good. I would say that if you're, um, even if you identify someone in your family that had heart disease early, it's also uh, important to understand their lifestyle. So mm -hmm. if your father had a heart attack in his 40s, but he smoked, he um, didn't take care of himself, he didn't you know, monitor his diabetes, and that's, those things also are additive to the family history. So it, the, you want to try to avoid those things as much as possible, especially if you have a strong family history. Okay, we've had a lot of great questions tonight. Can you think of anything that you really wanted uh, people to know about uh, their heart health uh, tonight in your visit with us here in the studio? I would definitely say do not delay getting evaluated if mm -hmm. possible. If you're having any symptoms that you're worried about being concerned for your heart or heart problems, um, talk to your regular doctor. Um, and uh, explore that avenue first. Um, most of them or a lot of them will send you to a cardiologist to be evaluated if they're concerned that it might be your heart. Um, again, as you've said several times, listen to your body. Yeah. Um, you know what you're able to do on a regular basis and if you find that you're not able to do that um, as much as, po as you used to, then um, get it evaluated and um, listen to your doctors. Yeah, all right. Dr. Morris Kelly, thanks for being with us tonight. Absolutely. We really appreciate your time. He's with CHI St. Vincent, uh, the North Little Rock Clinic. And if you would like to learn more about heart attack awareness and the latest treatments, you can go to chistvincent.com slash heart. And if you missed any part of tonight's web stream, you can catch it anytime here on the KATV Facebook page. Thanks for being with us tonight. Good night.